evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Fulton Lewis, Jr., speaking from the studios of W.O.L. in Washington. Well, it appears tonight that the House Judiciary Committee really started something yesterday when they tried to kill off the Hatch Dempsey Clean Politics Bill. I reported to you last night that the Judiciary Committee, after considering the Hatch Dempsey Bill for nearly a month and after assuring the sponsor of it, Representative Dempsey, day after day that they would approve it before long, after all that, they suddenly took a vote yesterday behind closed doors and they voted 14 to 10 to table the bill. To set it aside for the remainder of this session, which would mean, of course, that the legislation would be dead unless the sponsors of it could get it to the floor for action in some other extraordinary way. That meeting was supposed to have been strictly secret yesterday, but it seems that some members of the committee refused to be bound by the secrecy rule, and so through them the story got out this afternoon as to just what happened in the meeting yesterday. And that story has produced a regular hornet's nest of controversy in the House cloakrooms all day long. It seems that the committee, the Judiciary Committee, already had taken a record vote on whether or not to table the bill, and in that record vote, each member of the committee knew how the other members had voted, of course. There was a margin of seven votes against setting it aside. Then, just before the close of the meeting yesterday, a secret ballot was taken, typewritten slips of paper, one saying yes and one saying no, were handed to each member of the committee. The box was passed around and the member dropped one slip or the other into the box as he saw fit, and on that one, that secret vote, with no fingerprints, the vote was 14 to 10 in favor of the death sentence, a margin of four votes the other way, a shift of 11, in other words, all told. That is almost an unprecedented procedure in any committee of Congress, that secret ballot. It hasn't been done since the old days years ago when the machine bosses of the Republican Party ruled the committees of Congress with an iron hand. And the members of Congress in general were extremely critical today of that procedure. The attitude was that committee members who are passing on legislation for recommending it or not recommending it to the House should at least have the courage to vote frankly and openly within the committee, certainly. But if a congressman is afraid to let his fellow committee members know how he votes on a bill that they all have studied, it's likely to sit very badly indeed in public opinion. Now, in the meantime, the sponsor of the bill, Representative Dempsey of New Mexico, said he will bring in a petition tomorrow and lay it on the table in the House chamber to be signed by members of the House. And if he gets 218 signatures on that petition, it means that the bill is forcibly taken out of the hands of the Judiciary Committee and brought to the House floor in spite of the committee's action. Whether or not Mr. Dempsey can get those 218 signatures, that remains to be seen. We probably will know more about that tomorrow night after the petition has been available, has been exposed to signatures for a few hours. Now, there's a bit of news tonight from New York City saying that Mrs. Roosevelt appeared at a luncheon there today and made the presentation of the Barter Theater Award for the outstanding performance by an American actor during 1940. She made that award to Miss Dorothy Stickney for Miss Stickney's role in the play Life with Father. And thereby hangs a story, not about Mrs. Roosevelt, nor the play, nor the actress, but rather about the Barter Theater, which makes the award. Back in 1932, you may recall the times were pretty terrible for all of us, but they were particularly terrible for the theatrical world. The legitimate theater already had suffered gravely from movie competition, but to make it worse, the theater is one of the first luxuries which the individual cuts off his list when times get hard. Almost every theater in New York was dark. Famous actors, hundreds of them, were walking the streets, hungry and jobless, and without so much as a roof over their heads. It made no sense at all, of course, any more than the general situation made any sense in those days. Farmers going into bankruptcy on a wholesale basis because they couldn't sell the corn and wheat and pork and beef which they raised on their farms. Millions of people in the cities crying for those very things in return for the kind of work that they were able to do. But the whole system, whereby the people in the city could exchange their work for the things that the farmer had on hand, that whole system had fallen apart completely. It had broken down, and so everyone was suffering all around. The tragedy was that no one had a solution. That is to say, no one except a young couple among those unemployed actors, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Porterfield. 
It happened that Mrs. Porterfield had been a teacher for several years. Shortly after she got out of school in a fashionable girls' finishing school in a beautiful old town in the extreme southwest corner of Virginia, down near Tennessee. The town of Abingdon, nestled in the wealthy valley there, high in the Blue Ridge Mountains. That girls' school had closed down, and so had another one in the same town, like many other things during the Depression. And Mrs. Porterfield conceived the idea that the trustees of that school probably would be glad to have someone occupy those buildings without any rent, just to keep them from going to rack and ruin by having someone in them. Why not go to Abington, then, and exchange good theater for some of that surplus food that the farmers there had on hand and couldn't sell? And that's just what happened. Mrs. Porterfield got about 25 actors and actresses together in New York. They rattled down to Abington, Virginia, in the summer of 1933 in the strangest, weirdest caravan of broken-down flivers that you ever laid eyes on. And they set up the Barter Theater. They made their own scenery and painted it. They put on the best of the New York plays. And instead of charging cash at the box office, they accepted whatever the customers brought in the way of barter. Corn, kindling wood, tomatoes, potatoes, butter, jelly, canned, home canned materials of all kinds. Nothing was turned down and it was left entirely up to the customer as to how much he thought the show was worth in his products. The system did have some shortcomings when the cabbage season was on, for example. The actors got terribly sick of cabbage by the end of two or three weeks. By the end of the tomato season, they never wanted to look, look another tomato in the face. But getting tired of too many tomatoes in a defunct girls' school in Abington, Virginia, was at that a whole lot better than going hungry with no roof over your head in New York City. And all in all, they were well satisfied with their luck. Along with the vegetables, of course, they got a certain amount of livestock, chickens, ducks. That first season, there was one farmer who brought in a calf in payment for a season ticket. The actors were highly excited about that. They decided to keep the calf, raise it, keep it until the following year, and the next season, they'd be able to have fresh milk every day. The New York actors, unfortunately, are not too well acquainted with farm technicality. After keeping the calf for a month, they found it was the wrong kind of calf. By that time, it was such a pet that they didn't have the heart to kill it, so they gave it back to the farmer. As a matter of fact, that last angle has been a problem from the very beginning. Every summer, hundreds of rabbits come into the box office. Calves, lambs, goats, everything you ever heard of. But they always insist upon putting them in a pen out in the yard somewhere until they are needed. Then nobody has the heart to kill them. If a meat course comes on the table for the actors, a meat course that looks like it might be leg of lamb, the whole company runs to the dining room window to see if the pets are all still there intact. By the end of the summer, there's a regular menagerie on hand which is given away or traded to the local paint store for the next year's scenery paint or perhaps to the printer or to some other creditor in the town. On one occasion, as a customer said he was uh, a coffin maker, he, he also added that he figured they wouldn't want any coffins, so he brought him a hand-carved walking stick. Another customer brought a rattlesnake skin, but he was so indiscreet as to fail to take the live rattlesnake from inside of the skin, and that almost caused a panic. They accepted it, though. The rule is that the Barter Theater accepts everything. Though. So there's the story. That first year, the Barter Theater finished with $4.30 in cash and two barrels of homemade jelly and canned goods. Last year, there were 82 actors and technicians in the colony. They had three companies touring the country for 200 miles around, and some trucks that they got by trading in some of the livestock. And they ended with $65 in cash and five barrels of jelly and canned goods. Of course, the customers can pay cash if they want to. In the last few years, particularly many of them do. All of which is something to remember during the campaigns of this summer, when the politicians on both sides of the fence tell you day after day in speeches that the only way to solve the economic problems of the nation is to let the politicians solve them. The actual award which Mrs. Roosevelt made today in New York was one acre of land on the side of one of the mountains there near Abington, one Virginia ham, and the right to send two young actors to the Barter Theater Colony this summer. Now, getting back to the regular news, Congress overrode a veto by President Roosevelt today, a thing that's been done very, very few times in all the history of the New Deal. It happened on a Spanish War veterans bill amounting to about $7 million to give certain veterans of the Spanish War in the Philippines about three to $400 apiece 
for certain travel allowances, which they did not get 40 years ago because of a technicality at the time. The sponsor of the bill was Representative Martin Smith of Washington State. He pushed it through Congress about a month ago, but last week the president sent it back with a veto. Representative Smith immediately called it up in the House of Representatives, and it was passed over the veto by considerably more than the necessary two-thirds. Today it came up in the Senate. With virtually no debate, it was passed again by a vote of 56 to 3, so automatically it becomes law without the president's signature. In the meantime, it develops that the president is making a last-minute effort to try to push through Congress at this session another slum clearance housing bill. Congress passed one $800 million program along that line several years ago, you recall. But that $800 million uh, item is about exhausted now. A year ago, Senator Bob Wagner of New York, the sponsor of the first program, introduced a bill calling for another $800 million. And that second one actually passed the Senate a year back. But it ran into a young David with a slingshot in the House of Representatives, 32-year-old Representative Albert Gore from... Secretary of State Hull's old district in Tennessee. Don't be misled, however, by that 32-year-old business because Mr. Gore really is, although he's serving his freshman term, is one of the uh, is widely regarded by Democrats and Republicans alike as one of the most able figures in the House. He made a study of that program. He's not opposed to slum clearance, but he did oppose the system by which this program operated. When the bill came to the House floor, he made a 10-minute speech that was one of the classics of all history. When he got through, the House decided by an overwhelming vote that it would not even take up the bill. In the meantime, Mr. Gore picked up a companion in his campaign against the slum clearance program as it now stands. Another freshman, age 38, Representative Mike Monroney of Oklahoma. One of the, also one of the bright young stars of the House, and the two of them have been blocking any action on this bill consistently all through the present session of Congress. The House leaders have told the President there isn't even any use in trying to get this bill through the House at this session unless it's revised in such a way that Mr. Gore will go on the floor and tell the House that it's all right that he approves it. And this morning, Mr. Gore of Tennessee and Mr. Monroney of Oklahoma were called to the White House and the President conferred with them in strict privacy for nearly an hour. When they left, they were most uncommunicative, but they told me that they were and are quite willing to help work out a revised program on a sound basis. I asked Mr. Gore whether he's planning to back down and his opposition to the housing program in its present form. He looked at his partner from Oklahoma and smiled, and then he said with a slow drawl, we Tennesseans don't understand very well what that term back down means, and you know most Oklahomans are descendants of Tennesseans. That's the job of the news as it looks from here, ladies and gentlemen, until tomorrow evening. Good night. Fulton Lewis, Jr. will be back on the air tomorrow at the same time, speaking from the studios of WOL, Washington, D.C. Your announcer, Stephen McCall.